You're on. So, what page is two, Ten. 210? There you go. You're a step ahead of me. Um, and then I thought at the end of our novena, we're going to pray the Hail Holy Queen, since this is about Our Lady the Queen, and we're going to talk about that prayer. Um, so that's how we'll begin. So I am sorry, hopefully, if you all pray. If these are allergies, whatever this is, goes away. <laughs> you can pray to whoever you are. <laughs> God sees outside of time. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Holy Child Mary of the Royal House of David, Queen of the Angels, Mother of Grace and Love, I greet you with all my heart. Obtain for me the grace to love the Lord faithfully during all the days of my life. Obtain for me, too, a great devotion to you, who are the first creature of God's love. Hail, Hail Mary. Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O heavenly child Mary, who like a pure dove was born immaculate and beautiful, true progeny of the wisdom of God. My soul rejoices in you. Do help me to preserve the angelic virtue of purity at the cost of any sacrifice. Hail Mary, Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail, lovely and holy child, spiritual garden of delight, where on the day of the incarnation, the tree of life was planted. Assist me to avoid the poisonous fruit of vanity and pleasures of the world. Help me to engraft into my soul the thoughts, feelings, and virtues of your divine Son. Hail Mary. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail, admirable child Mary, mystical rose, closed garden, open only to the heavenly spouse. O lily of paradise, make me love the humble and hidden life. Let the heavenly spouse find the gate of my heart always open to the loving calls of his graces and inspiration. Hail Mary. Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Holy Child Mary, mystical dawn, gate of heaven, you are my trust and my hope. O powerful advocate from your cradle, stretch out your hand, support me on the path of life, make me serve God with ardor and constancy until death, and so reach an eternity with you. Amen. 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 Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Sorry. <laughs> Blessed child Mary, destined to be the mother of God and our loving mother, by the heavenly graces that you lavish upon us, mercifully listen to my supplications. In the needs which press upon me from every side, especially in my present tribulations, I place all my trust in you. O holy child, by the privileges granted to you alone and by the merits which you have acquired, Show that the source of spiritual favors and the continuous benefits which you dispense are inexhaustible because your power with the heart of God is unlimited. Deign through the immense profusion of graces with which the Most High has enriched you from the first moment of your immaculate conception. Grant me, O celestial child, my petitions, and I shall eternally praise the goodness of your immaculate heart Hail, hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs. Oh, 
pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. The Maria Bambina, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm hoping the Benadryl kicks in. <laughs> um, and I will try to blow my nose at a minimum, but I shall not be intimidated by pain and the cross to not do the will of God. <laughs> So, onward we go. I think I inherited that from my mom, <laughs> right? So, I do think that something will kick in, though, here, and I'll clear up. So, When she became the mother of the creator, she truly became the queen of every creature. That was St. John Damascene. Our lady is our queen. And you see her particularly under this title here in the way that the Hispanics dress up the infant Mary, the Maria Bambina. She is in a, like a, a queenly gown, right? She has the diamond rings and the um, bracelets, even little earrings. Um, all of those jewels are symbols of her virtue and holiness. And you know from... Um, St. Ildefonsus, that book, The Crown of Mary, that I've read from, he talks about the different jewels that she is like. I focused more on like the stars and the, and the light. But if you read the entire work, most of what he compares Our Lady to is jewels, right? And so that's why she's covered in jewels. I would not be a fan of placing lots of jewels on a small baby, <laughs> right? <laughs> but... Um, this is, you know, a symbol of her as our little queen. And um, she is that, that diamond that shines brilliantly and yet is so strong that nothing can break that virtue, right? Um, each jewel has a symbolism, and he goes through that in that book. So if you're interested in that, it's just a little, a little read. Um, it's called The Crown of Our Lady, but Our Lady is our queen. When she said yes to be the mother of the Redeemer, she said yes to be the mother of the redeemed, which means when she was the mother of the Savior who would suffer and die for us, she said yes to be our mother and to take our sufferings upon herself. And we talked for, it was a really long time last week, right? About what it means to be Our Lady of Sorrows and the co-redemptrix. But... The, the opposite is also true. If she is the mother of the king of heaven and earth, then she is a queen, right? Who has ever heard of a king whose mother is not a queen? And so um, it's really beautiful because we, as we're baptized into Christ, are baptized into his royalty. And he is our head and we are made children of God, little princes and princesses of heaven, right? Right? And he assumes when he pours upon us that dignity of becoming a child of God, um, he offers to us that dignity of, of living kind of that royal call. And Our Lady is our queen mother. There's a beautiful quote later on here from Therese of Lisieux that we'll read where she talks about what it means for her to be our queen mother, right? So... But we'll start with St. Maximilian Kolbe. And he says, The queen of heaven and earth, in a loving family, the parents fulfill the desire of their child or their children in all that is humanly possible, provided, of course, that what they ask not be harmful to them. All the more almighty God, the creator and model of earthly parents, desires to fully satisfy the will of his creatures. That's really beautiful. You know, God created us with a free will, not so that he could feel powerful by dominating it, but by teaching us to ask for what is right and then to fulfill that will, right? He wants us to ask and he wants to fulfill what we ask for. And what I was going to say about Our Lady as our Queen Mother is she's the same way. She has this great power, but it's put at service of us, her children, right? The children of heaven. And so it should um, just infuse our prayers with great faith and hope and confidence that when we turn to her, we're turning to one who is um, 
both capable of and wanting to fulfill our desires um, to make us happy, right? So the Immaculata never departed from anything that God's will demanded, right? And so when she prays, everything she prays for, you can't, I'm so sorry, because um, it's broke and taped up there. And if you do it, the whole thing will fall on your head. <laughs> you can never touch the blinds in my house. <laughs> They're all aesthetic. I'm so sorry. But you can move up here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the secret of my broken home. Um, but when we ask her to pray for us, she perfects our prayers according to the perfect will of God. And so she will never ask for something that's not capable of um, being fulfilled by the Father because she like beautifies and perfects it, right? So that it is according to his will. If we ask for something that is a tinge of selfishness, she knows how to pray for it so that we could be granted it without it making us selfish, but instead to make us selfless, right? I am so sorry. Anyway, this must be important. <coughs> Excuse me. Curie Lason. And we unite this to Jesus for all of you. The Immaculata never departed from anything that God's will demanded. In all things, she loved the will of God. She loved God. Hence, she is rightly called the omnipotent beseecher, which means everything she asks of God is granted. She is influence with God over the whole of the universe. She is its queen in heaven and on earth. God knows that her will is perfectly conformed to his. And so he gifts her with the ability and um, the right to be our queen. To actually be in charge. Not just like a fake thing. Like he puts her picture right next to him. She get, he gives her power. She is the omnipotent beseecher, right? Mm -hmm. It's not her own power. She has so laid herself at the service of the Father that he allows his power to work through her perfectly. She is literally in charge. So, like, when you go to Our Lady and say, like, remember, O oh, most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that Anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Whoa, right? Mm -hmm. Never was it known. And that's why Mother Teresa, when she had an emergency, would pray the novena of the memorari. She would just pray that and remind Our Lady of that nine times in a row, and it always was answered. <laughs> you know, inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, our mother, our queen, right? So it's because she is that omnipotent beseecher. She is the queen of heaven and earth. In heaven, all recognize her say of love. They recognize that her love is so perfect. Everything she says and she wills is, comes from love and is at the service of love. And so it's respected and honored um, next to Christ more than any other creature. That portion of the angels who would not recognize her queenship lost its place in heaven. Many writers say that the reason that Satan fell was he had to accept the fact that Christ would become incarnate as a man, right? Why didn't he become an angel? That he would be born of a woman and this woman would be raised to such dignity. And in his own pride, in his own vanity, his own competitiveness, he looked at her and said, I will not serve. And so the result of that, that lack of obedience, is that um, she crushed his head with her foot, right? We talked last, last week about how her fiat under the cross was so powerful that the tears she cried in union with Christ, offering like that priest, that victim, that altar, were as heavy as like golden stones that crushed Satan, right? Why? Because her fiat was that powerful. She is also the queen of earth. She is the mother of God. She desires and has a right to be freely recognized by every creature, by every heart, to be loved as queen of all hearts, 
so that through her, hearts would be cleansed and themselves become immaculate, similar and like unto her own heart, so worthy of union with God and with the divine love of the sacred heart of Jesus. I love when I look out of my little kitchen window into that kitchen garden kind of area, and I have Our Lady of Guadalupe there, and the animals take refuge under Our Lady. You know, not just the birds with the bird feeders, but like I told my mom, a pregnant bunny is like living right under Our Lady right now. You know, the squirrels, even my geese found my bird feeder, but they came over and they're like looking at Our Lady and they're looking away and they're looking, I mean, it was so funny. Um, stray cats, like they all find refuge under her. And it's funny because what did he say? She's not just the queen of all people. That's obviously the most important, but she is the, the queen of all creatures, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, yes, all of heaven and earth that is not disrupted by the disorder of sin is at her service and recognizes her love. He continues, this is Maximilian Colby, we call her mother, but an earthly mother is not free of limitations. Even the law must sometimes protect children with respect to their parents, right? We know that all too well, Vicki. <laughs> For years, the two of us worked at CAPS with abused kids that were taken away, right? Um, you hear these stories of what happens, and it's so sad So, you know, look at abortion, like just to be a mother doesn't mean that people respond to the grace given with that and love, right? Meanwhile, she is a mother without stain. She is not only like a good mom, you know, like maybe all of you are, but she's a perfect mom. Even all of you who are good can probably think of mistakes that you've made. Um, Our lady never makes a mistake. Not with Christ, but also not with us, not with the greatest sinner. She's without stain. She's immaculate. Any reservation or restriction on the part of her children would rightly cause her ineffable pain and sadness. All she wants is the salvation of her children. You know, if there are people who don't have good and holy mothers that love them, I always suggest to them that they give their own mother to Our Lady and they just take her as their mother. And then when you place her between your relationship with your mother, when it's a very wounded or a bad one, um, she changes your mother and she provides for you in what you're not doing. When I meet children who I can't change their mom and I can't take them away, all I try to do is insert our lady and her presence fills in the gaps, right? We call her our lady but that concept may draw us away from her maternal heart. We call her queen, but here too, we must be careful to add of all hearts, queen of love. Her law is that of love. Her power is maternal love. So she's not a queen that wants to rule for the sake of ruling. She is a queen that wants to use her authority um, with powerful love. It's everything's placed that way. And it's with a maternal love that's healing. Um, You know, why is she called our queen? Well, she's the mother of the Prince of Peace, the King of Heaven and Earth, right? And we celebrate this title every time. It's not, you know, anything surprising in the church. Every time we pray the rosary, every time we pray that fifth, glorious mystery of the coronation of our lady we celebrate her queenship right she's the queen of heaven and earth her queenship so sorry her um her queenship is something that from the early early church was recognized in fact even in scripture itself it refers to our lady as being that great queen Um, Pope Pius established the Feast of the Queenship of Our Lady in 1954. And so now on um, August 22nd, that's her feast day and the whole church, you know, recognizes that. But even in scripture, I, I write there how um, in, Saint Lu- in 
St. Luke, how Elizabeth says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? What You only call someone a Lord when they are royalty, right? So kind of like saying, who am I that the mother of my king should come to me, right? And when um, Gabriel announced to Our Lady that she was expecting a child, he himself said that the child, the son, would receive the throne of David and rule forever. So she, he already was speaking about his, his royal kingship. Um, and Our Lady, when she responds to these graces in the Magnificat, she herself says, all generations will call me blessed. And um, in Revelation, of course, is the most famous. I think it's what our minds are always turned to, right? She is the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. On her head is a crown of 12 stars. And um, when... (coughs) Excuse me. Um, (coughs) When Our Lady appeared in... Well, whenever she appears, there's a great light and often a crown that accompanies her. But um, Our Lady of Guadalupe came as our great queen, right? And we see this image of revelation in the tilma and in, you know, she's dressed as a mother, very much obviously pregnant, but she is dressed as our queen, right? That paint on there was never, they just... They just did that it was living? Yeah. So what was that exactly? I just, I skimmed it. Yeah, well, I just remember parts of it all through the paint. It's there's living. No such, there's no such thing as that paint. No, but I just saw that they said that the image is living so that it, like, changes according to something. Yeah. Oh. It's, like, scientifically impossible. Yeah. Did you see this? Yeah, what was I it? Too. I can't remember what it was. No. Got to check Facebook. Yeah. But <laughs> it was this, it, the scientists just did new testing, and there was something on it that's actually, like, growing and living and i know that they found a heartbeat on it before yeah um so her eyes like there's reflection are in her eyes right pupils right you can see uh in her in her eyes right the whole thing is incredible the constellation on her gown is Mm -hmm. the night sky of that evening so she wants to manifest herself to us as our queen, right? But not to instill fear, but to instill confidence, right? Because she is the great queen of love. And um, like when you think about the holiness of womanhood, a woman who is good and holy should inspire nothing but confidence. It's only when a woman does not fulfill her vocation that she's scary, right? (laughs) Like a wicked queen is probably more evil than a wicked king. But when a woman is doing the will of God, like how, you know, just think about like what a mom does to a child, you know? Um, And she is the holiest and the most perfect of all women and of all queens. And so... She comes to us to give us peace. So when you reject that, you're really rejecting a great, great gift of comfort. Um, not only like help through asking her prayer, but you're, you're rejecting like that motherly love that would heal your wounded heart, that would guide you, that would provide for you. It's really sad. I don't ever get angry at those who reject Our Lady. I pity them. I can't imagine life in this world without the hand of my mother. So in the fourth century, St. Ephraim called Our Lady um, the Queen, right? And then later church fathers and doctors continued to use the title. St. Antonius said, whoever asks and expects to obtain graces without the intercession of Mary endeavors to fly without wings. If God chose to give the earth Christ through Our Lady, then he's going to choose to give us graces through Our Lady, right? And it's only a jealous or a competitive or self-righteous heart that would argue that, thinking, well, why do I need Our Lady? You know, why can't I just go straight to God? That's actually just pride. Um, When you look in all truth, which humility is truth, like, of course we need help. And of course we would need the same help that God the Father chose for his son, right? Um, 
The Hail Holy Queen was written in the 11th century. It's a beautiful story of the prayer. There was a poor disfigured monk named Hermanus Contractus. He lived in 1054, right? He was a cripple and he was born with a cleft plate and cerebral palsy and spina bifida. And he had a great difficulty moving. When he was seven years old, his parents placed him in a monastery, right? As they kind of rejected him. And uh, when you know that prayer comes from him, it's even more beautiful than if it didn't, right? Because he was known to write beautiful things and beautiful prayers. He was very smart. But when you know that that, you know, that confidence looking to her as his queen um, comes from the, of course, God always chooses the weak, the imperfect, the lowly, right? Um, but to know it came from this poor abandoned child who then embraced the religious life so beautifully, so perfectly, um, it gives more beauty to the Hail Holy Queen, right? So we thank St. Hermanus for that. Um, Mary is queen of heaven and earth in every way. She is queen by grace because she was immaculately conceived. She was given that grace to become our, our queen. She was preserved from sin and she was full of grace, like Gabriel said, right? Mary is also queen, not just by grace, but by divine relationship. The mother of the king would be also a queen. And, you know, many of the church teachers have said that she's even closer to Christ as a mother than most mothers are, because most mothers give half of the DNA to their children. She gave all of it since he was, you know, conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit. So she's even more united to him than a mother is to their child, right? So that she also is queen in that way. Um, and she's also queen by right of conquest. I think that's a beautiful way to put it. It's through her own personal choice in her individual soul to always say yes and conform to the will of God. We talked about how, um, you know, on, under the cross, she suffered with Christ in many different ways. But not only did she suffer and offer the Father Christ's suffering, she offered the Father Christ as her son. But then she thirdly offered her own suffering to the Father, right? You can feel Christ's suffering in your heart and offer that, you know, or you can feel allergies overtake you and offer that. That's my own suffering I'm giving to Christ on the cross to use. But I could also sit here and think about Christ so much like some of the saints that I feel his wounds in my hand and then I'm offering God Christ's suffering in me, right? But this is Mary Klaska's suffering. And so Our Lady offered Christ's suffering. She offered Christ as her son, but she offered the Blessed Mother's suffering too, right? Perfectly. And so she is a queen by conquest because her fiat, her own individual decision to surrender to the will of God in, the, in Mary, the Blessed Mother's soul at every moment, one concrete grace, right? That was not just infused there. Some people might say, oh, it'd be easy to be the Blessed Mother if you were you know, given all these graces. She had a choice. She had a choice. And because she was given the Immaculate Conception, it was harder for her to consent to the cross than if she had been full of sin because she was so sensitive. She fully understood what it meant to take on the sin of the world. She was so repulsed by evil. So her fiat was not easier because she was perfect. It was harder because she had to fiat in faith to sin and to trust that the father had a plan greater than that sin. You know what I'm saying? So it doesn't make sense when people say, like, try to belittle that grace. She is a queen by conquest. And, and it goes on, Calvary was the scene of that conquest. 
During his passion, Christ said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, right? She also says, my kingdom is not of this world. Not everyone in this world recognizes Our Lady, even though she has ultimate power given to her by Christ, the king who sits on her, th her lap as a throne, right? And she is not a mother, a queen mother of justice, just trying to implement the law. You know, a king tends to do that more, right? But a queen was always known when they're good and holy to be one of mercy. She's a queen mother of mercy. In the litany of Loretto of Our Lady, we call her the queen of angels, the queen of patriarchs, the queen of prophets, the queen of martyrs, the queen of confessors the queen of virgins, the queen of peace, the queen of the most holy rosary, the queen of families, mm -hmm. the queen conceived without original sin, the queen assumed into heaven. The church like gives us this to repeat over and over. And so when we call on her as our queen, it gives her the right and the power to reign in our own little lives, right? Mm -hmm. She has that given to her by God over the universe. But she would not infringe upon our free will. She needs our consent. You know what I mean? But when we give her that, then she becomes the queen of us. And everything works out beautifully. <clears throat> Mary is called the mother of Christ the queen. Sorry, Christ the king. But she is also the queen of his body. He is the head and we are his body which means she is the queen of us, right? Who's ever heard of a mother who's only the mother of the head of their child? <laughs> okay, you're, you're the mother of the whole child, right? So our lady is the same way, right? She's the mother of the head, Christ, and all of us. The Second Vatican Council explains this. This maternity of Mary in the order of grace began with the consent which she gave in, the, in faith at the Annunciation and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross. And it lasts until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect. Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside the salvific duty, but by her constant intercession, continued to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. By her maternal charity, she cares for the brethren of her son, who still journey on earth surrounded by dangers and cults cultics until they are led into the happiness of their true home. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked by the church. This is the Second Vatican Council. She is invoked by the church under the titles of advocate auxiliatrix, which is very close in Latin to co-redemptrix, and it's written right here audritrix and mediatrix. This, however, is to be so understood that it neither takes away from nor adds anything to the dignity and efficaciousness of Christ the one mediator. So Christ mediates perfectly as the Son of God, as the Savior of the world. She is the helpmate. It's like God decided to wrap this, this Savior of the world in Our Lady, like wrapping paper, right? Like his flesh came from her, is every, you know? And he's choosing to give graces through her, but they come from Christ. They're won by Christ. Their source is Christ, right? St. Alphonsus Liguori explains this also beautifully in the glory of Our Lady. This is long, but it's beautiful. If I can make it. <laughs> the church honors the Virgin Mary with the glorious title of queen because she has been elevated to the dignity of the mother of the king of kings. If the son is king, says St. Athanasius, his mother must necessarily be considered queen. From the moment that Mary consented to become the mother of the eternal word, she merited the title of the queen of the world and of all creatures. If the flesh of Mary, says St. Arnold, was the flesh of Jesus, how can the mother be separated from the son of his kingdom? It thus follows that the regal glory must not only be considered as common to the mother and the son, 
but must even be the same, right? So if the regal glory is given to Christ the head, it's also given to Our Lady who shared that DNA and she wants to share that regal glory with us, right? When we're baptized into Christ. People who contradict Our Lady's queenship are sadly contradicting their own identity as children of God, right? Because what she was raised to in perfection, we're all called to. And after going through a purgatory, after, whether it be on earth or in heaven, when we're brought to heaven in perfection, we will truly be her children. We'll never be as perfect as her because she exponentially grew in perfection from her conception. But we are fully purified and the redemption of Christ can fully redeem us, right? Okay. Mary then is queen, but let all learn for their consolation that she is a mild and a merciful queen, right? There's nothing to fear about our mother. She desires the good of all sinners. Therefore, the church salutes her in prayer and names her the Queen of Mercy. One of my favorite titles of Our Lady, right? Our Queen Mother of Mercy. The very name of Queen signifies, as Albert the Great remarks, compassion and provision for the poor. Any good and holy queen always showed a predilection for the poor, right? And so she shows predilection for us, her poor ones. Differing in this form, differing in this from the title of empress, which signifies severity and rigor. An empress, you think about an empress, she's like a ruler. She's almost male in the citing with justice and like implementing the law, right? But a queen, she... Um, she leans down. You look at the, the best queens in the history of the world. Think about Queen um, Elizabeth of Hungary, right? Or, you know, some of the saints that were queens. They showed a predilection for the poor and clemency, right? Clemency. <clears throat> the greatness, this is still Alphonsus Liguori. The greatness of kings and queens consists in comforting the wretched, so that whereas tyrants have only their own advantage in view, kings should be concerned with the good of their subjects. Therefore, at the consecration of kings, their heads are anointed with oil, which is a symbol of mercy, to denote that in ruling, they should always show kindness and goodwill toward their subjects, right? And we see that in like King Kashmir, some of the great, see King Louis, right? Some of the great kings of the history of the church. Kings then should principally occupy themselves with works of mercy, but they should not neglect the exercise of justice toward the guilty when it's required. It would be awful if a mom always let one of her children get away with something really naughty, right? It's not fair to the other kids. So you want to be really merciful, but there is justice, and children need to learn that in order to grow in virtue. Our Lady is the same way. She is the queen of great mercy, but it would be wrong for her not to show justice, right? So when somebody lies and another person ends up in prison, the queen mother wants to expose that lie, not to embarrass that child, but to bring justice to the one calumniated, right? And to help the one who lied to grow in virtue, right? So, you know, I used to more fear the justice of God, but not when I understand that the justice and the mercy of God are actually the same thing. And Therese of Lisieux found great comfort in the justice of God because justice means that God the Father looks on you redeemed by his son. Like in justice, Christ paid for your forgiveness of sins. So claim it. Like, you know, it's it was mm-hmm. merciful that Christ did it. But it's just that it counts, <laughs> right? So Our Lady is the Queen of Mercy. It doesn't mean she's a pushover, right? She also implements a great justice. So you see that um, Mother Cabrini and the work that she was trying to do, right? 
She would pray for great mercy for Our Lady to help her. And yet it was the justice of God that brought her money to buy buildings she didn't have. You would say, how? That's mercy. No. It, it, right? The worker deserves their pay. She was working for the Lord and he provided what she needed to do that work. And so it's only just that God would provide for her and merciful, right? Um, but it's also the justice of God that does that. Um, my dad always said growing up, if you do what God's will is, he'll take care of you, right? And I'm sure both of my parents could tell you countless stories of where we had nothing and God provided. Was it merciful? Yes. But it also was a beautiful face of the justice of God that said, look, you are open to life. You had 13 children. You took in foster kids. You did this pro-life work, you, you know, and you deserve to be provided for, you know. So she is the queen of, the mer of mercy. And Mary is not a queen of justice intent on the punishment of the guilty for the sake of the punishment, right? But she is a queen of mercy intent only on compassion and pardon for sinners. She wants pardon of sinners. But for example, a liar who puts somebody else in jail cannot be forgiven unless they acknowledge they've lied and ask forgiveness, right? So sometimes what we would consider humanly as a punishment is not. It's God just trying to get them to recognize they did something wrong because he so wants to pour out his mercy on them. But we're also free to accept or reject that mercy. Does that make sense? Accordingly, the church calls Our Lady the Queen of Mercy. Psalm 62 says, These two things which I heard, that power belongs to you, God, and yours, O Lord, is kindness. You know, power would be the justice of God. Kindness would be the mercy. But justice and mercy kiss, right? They're both poured out together. The Lord has divided the kingdom of God into two parts, justice and mercy. He has reserved the kingdom of justice for himself and has granted the kingdom of mercy to Mary. St. Thomas Aquinas confirms this when he says that the Holy Virgin when she consented to be the mother of the Redeemer, obtained half of the kingdom of God by becoming the queen of mercy, while Christ remained the king of justice. But why again is he the king of justice? Because in his own body, he suffered as the Redeemer to purchase us. So it's only just that we receive that purchase, right? You know, that prayer I love, exhausted you sought me, crucified you saved me, may your wounds not be in vain. He paid the price, right? So we just want to apply that justice. Is there anyone who does not know the power of Mary's prayer with God? If not, know it, right? Every prayer of hers is like a law that mercy shall be given to those for whom she intercedes. So every time you pray for someone or entrust yourself to her, you're asking for her merciful prayer. St. Bernard of Clairvaux asks why the church names Mary the Queen of Mercy. It's because we believe that she obtains mercy of God for all who seek it, so that not even the greatest sinner is lost if Mary protects him. Not even the greatest sinner. You know, I believe things, I, I'm an intellectual, I know reason. We were raised pretty philosophically, you know, we're logical, we that's the way we were raised. Not everyone in this world is by far, <laughs> but that, that's the way my brain works. But I tend in my personality to believe experience greater than fact, right? So like you can tell me a fact about a child, but if I've taken care of 700 children and my experience has taught me something, I'm going to rely on that more. It's like that women's intuition, right? And so... I know in my brain that Our Lady is this great advocate, that she is the queen of mercy, that nothing we ask of her is, you know, um, ever rejected. And I could prove it to you by the teachings of the church. But when I recommend Our Lady to people, it's that part of me that leans on experience. It's experiential knowledge. I'm sorry. 
anyone who fled to her protection, mm-hmm. implored her help, or sought her intercession was left any. It's never heard, right? And so when people come to me often, like they do with diabolical messes, right? They just somehow know like, oh, we can't find help in the church anywhere for this. What do I do? I don't always have a recommendation um, logically. Like you have to do this, this, and this. What I try to do is insert Mary, you know, place miraculous medals in your home, start praying the rosary. You know, I just send them to Mary because my experience tells me it will help. She's the queen of peace. Peace will come. I don't have the answer. I don't know how to fix messes made from people's sin because sometimes they're really complicated. I'm like, I don't even know how to untangle this. But, you know, I tend to rely on that. Like, oh, Our Lady Queen of Peace. Oh, just say your name a lot. Oh, just, you know, do this, do this. And peace comes to the home. And then they can figure it out with Our Lady what exactly to do. But what you want to do is give to people peace, right? Mm -hmm. And then God is a place to work. So... I, can, I could spend weeks without a break telling you stories I've seen all over the world where inserting Our Lady fixes things. But I don't necessarily always know how. And I know that the fathers of the church claim it, but for me it's like an experiential confidence, right? That without a shadow of a doubt, I know if you place Our Lady there, it will get better, you know? Where Mary goes, peace goes, and like all, all answers to problems come. <clears throat> Every prayer of hers is like a law that mercy shall be given to those for whom she intercedes. All oh, right, here we are. We believe that she obtains the mercy of God for all who seek it. So that not even the greatest sinner is lost if Mary protects him. She'll keep him alive, you know. There's that story of that priest who died, and he wasn't a horrible priest. He was a selfish priest. And he, you know, really got into the the fame, the power that you have, the riches. Although, like, priests don't live, like, a high, high life, but they're not always living the simplicity they're called to. And he was a priest for himself. He died in a car accident and he was standing at the throne of God and he was being condemned to hell because he lived his priesthood for himself. And when he saw it in truth, he knew it was true. And right before it happened, he heard a voice and it was Our Lady. And she said, wait, my son. Um, And she started pleading for this priest. And she said, if you give him to me, give him another chance, give him to me, he will change. And so Jesus said, okay, mother, he's yours. And he came back to life. And he remembered the whole thing. And he lived the rest of his priesthood telling this story and spreading devotion to Our Lady and had a chance to change. This is not like somebody who like abused minors or like some scandal. This was just a normal priest to other people that was good, that was selfish, right? Wasn't willing to serve souls the way he was called to serve. And Our Lady won that for him. That's an example for all of us what Our Lady will do, you know. Um, She obtains mercy of God for all who seek it, and she protects all sinners. Some might think that Mary hesitates in pleading on behalf of some sinners because she finds them so sinful. Should the majority and sanctity of this great queen alarm us? No, says St. Gregory the Great. In proportion to her greatness and holiness are her clemency and mercy towards sinners who wish to repent and have great recourse to her. She uses the power of her purity in the Immaculate Conception not to run away from sinners to keep herself so pure, but she opens it before the Father so he can pour his divine love, which is forgiving. And it becomes a portal for her to show greater clemency and mercy to them. Okay. Kings and queens inspire terror by the display of their majesty. You see them dressed in a robe and a crown and you're afraid. Their subjects fear to go before them. But what fear, says St. Bernard, can sinners have going to this queen of mercy? 
her crown, what makes up those jewels, is symbolic of her virtue. Are you afraid to go to somebody with infinite patience to ask their help again, right? She never shows herself austere and those who seek her, but is always gentle and kind. She's mild. We talk about that. Our lady's so meek and so mild, right? She's like that with us. She's gentle. Hail Mary, gentle woman, right? Um, gentleness is a virtue that's been lost in the world. And it's, you know, one of the most profound attributes of Our Lady when you meet her is her gentleness. This gentleness and kindness of Our Lady, the Queen Mother of Mercy, are spoken of by Therese of Lisieux in her last confidences, right? It's at the end of the story of a soul. Mary then is queen, but queen in the way of a mother, serving all her children, guiding them in their most personal and intimate life, not so much by law and precept as by kindly prompting and persuasion with an affectionate smile on her countenance as she goes about bestowing a mother's tender care on all of her children, on the lowliness, lowliest no less than on the more fortunate. She's not a mom that comes in the room and lays down the law, right? Say you're a mom, you have a son that's left the church, that's living in sin, that's doing this. Our lady would go to him as his mother, um, not condemning him or saying, you made your bed, sleep in it, you know what I mean? But instead with that mercy and clemency, with a love that tries to open a door for him to come back to the Lord that wants to lift that burden for him. It does not condone the erroneous decisions they've made, but it's um, a kindness that wants to lure them back to the Lord. Do you kind of understand that difference? Okay. In fact, the more humble and lowly her children, the more mother she is to them. Who's your favorite child? I have a sister that always said the sick one, right? The one being left out, the littlest. And like when I was in an orphanage, you'd have 20 babies. Which one did I give attention to? The one with malaria is the one I tied on myself as I went from bed to bed and did everything else, right? The one whose mom had died in childbirth, whose father wanted an abortion and wouldn't stop crying. So they thought he'd die of sorrow and that would happen. He's the one that I would tie on myself for days on end because they are the weakest, the smallest. And I am adamant in my work in the church to have predilection for the poor, for the poorest of the poor, right? And it's not always the physically poor. Sometimes it is, but it's the spiritually poor. So if one of you needs something, I'll help you. But if one of my poor needs me, I place you aside. There's only one Mary. So the one who really needs me is someone who doesn't even have the faith or an orphan that doesn't even have, you know, maybe I can't have all of you live here with me, but I definitely make room for the refugee or the orphan or the, you know, um, the sick. It might even look like it's a predilection for the rich because sometimes it's the rich, but they don't have God and they are so deprived. They need me more than you. I could look at you and be like, you know, they're going to be okay. You know what I mean? Like I could usually make that judgment like this, right? And I get extremely frustrated when I see people in the church or ministries play off the poor. We don't make money off the gospel. We don't just help those who can um, help us out. Like in White Christmas, being Crosby said, everybody's got an angle. I get so mad when I see it, you know, like, well, you know, they'll help me with a lot of money and then my ministry will have a lot of money. So what? These people are dying in a war zone without any help and they need this book. Publish it. You know what I mean? And like, and yes, it might even take from your paycheck. Um, but you can't have an angle. You can't do something for your, your own benefit. Our Lady is my image to that. When Salt, the Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, I spent years with, and the founder formed me. It was almost like I was infused with that charism, just like he was. And he pounded that in. When you go to a mission, you find the deepest apostolic need. So there might be lots of needs, 
what's the deepest need. You know, alcoholism is bad, but the child who's drinking alcohol to keep warm on the street is deeper, you know? Um, it, I mean, and it, it's hard in places like Russia where there's so many needs. And I, in the end, decided that the presence of prayer was deepest. Because when you're crucified without Christ, it's hell. Suffering without Christ is hell, right? Communism took Christ from them. And all the needs were so deep, I saw that what I had to do is just climb on the cross and teach him to pray. You know, sometimes people are like, why would you provide a book to these people when they're starving? I physically can't feed all of Mongolia, okay? I just can't. I can give some books that give meaning in their suffering and inspire the catechists on the ground to think outside the box, to radically live for the gospel, and then they figure out the food issue, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it, Our Lady is that model. She always gives first option to the poorest, to the most desperate, right? So, you know, also you could have all these souls coming to you. But if most of them could go to any priest and get an answer, the ones that a priest should really never reject are those who the church has already wounded, where the other priests have turned away. Maybe they don't have the expertise to help. Those are the souls that come to me. Nobody knows what to do with demonic whatever. Okay. You know, some souls that come to me, you know what? You can go to Father so-and-so, so-and-so. They'll help you. They would be a great, you know, director for you. They'd be a great help. The normal everyday Catholic stuff would work. But people who have particular issues that others can't help, well, then those are the ones I got to give my divided time to. You know what I mean? Um, most everyday common homeschooling families are going to be just fine. You know, if you go to the right parish, <laughs> like seriously, like you're not going to fall away. God will give them the resources. Um, so our lady as the queen does that. Right. And she calls us when we go to her to imitate her in that. Right. Um, so the lowliest. OK, right. In fact, the more humble and lowly her children, the more mother she is to them. The more we put ourselves in Our Lady's guiding care, the more quickly she leads us up to God. This is Therese of Lisieux, if you forgot. In union with Christ, Mary guides the entire church militant on the road to the city of God. But Mary's rule is marked above all by the supreme grace of her motherhood. She rules and directs souls with the power of a mother's smile and the irresistible attraction of a mother's sweetness. With a mother's intuition, she is ever alert, one might say, to yield to the supremely sovereign and kingly action of her son, keeping herself in the background, for even in her own sovereign rule over the universe, Mary is more mother than queen. Even when she exercises that right as our queen mother to help us, she wants us to give all the glory to Christ and to heaven. She doesn't want the credit, right? So we are called to to imitate that. When we help people, we want to make sure that even in the help we're given, we're in the background, right? Say, um, you know, Andre Bassett was incredible with that. Everybody who came to him, he assigned to St. Joseph. Every healing that happened, he said, it's not me, it's St. Joseph. It's St. Joseph. It's St. Joseph, right? It's really beautiful. Pope St. John Paul II also spoke extensively in a general audience on July 23rd, 1997, about Our Lady as our Queen, explaining how her queenship does not take priority over her role as a mother. Just because she's queen doesn't make her less mother, Right? And just because she's mother doesn't make her less queen. Instead, her queenship ennobles her motherhood, raising her maternity to greater glory, right? It, it doesn't make her like separate because, whoa, she's queen. Instead, it makes her like even closer to her people. It should inspire greater confidence. Pope St. John Paul II said, popular devotion invokes Mary as queen. 
The Vatican Council, after recalling the assumption of the Blessed Virgin in body and soul into heavenly glory, explains that she was exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, that she might be all the more fully conformed to her son, the Lord of Lords, and conqueror of sin and death. She is made queen because it makes her closer to Christ. When we go to her as queen and she helps us, every time we're helped by her, she's even closer to Christ. Because every time you're an instrument of the love of God, you grow in that love of God. And every time she helps us, she draws us closer to Christ, right? So it's just really beautiful. In fact, starting from the 5th century, almost in the same period in which the Council of Ephesus proclaimed her the mother of God, the title of queen begins to be attributed to her. That's all the way from the 400s, so this is old in the church. With this further recognition of her sublime dignity, the Christian people want to place her above all creatures, exalting her role and importance in the life of every person, and of the whole world. Already a fragment of a homily attributed to Origen contains this comment on the words that Elizabeth spoke at the visitation. It is I who should have come to visit you because you are blessed among all women. You are the mother of my Lord. You are my lady. The text passes spontaneously from the expression of mother of my Lord to the title of my lady or my queen, anticipating what St. John Damascene was later to say, attributing to Mary the title of sovereign. When she became the mother of the creator, she truly became the queen of all creatures. My venerable predecessor, Pius Twelfth, in his encyclical, um, which... He's writing in his encyclical that came from Lumen Gentium. So um, in his encyclical, he's quoting Lumen Gentium, which is part of Vatican II, the documents, okay? He says, The basis for Mary's queenship, in addition to her motherhood, her cooperation in the work of the redemption, recalls this liturgical text. There was St. Mary, Queen of Heaven and the Sovereign of the World, sorrowing near the cross of her Lord Jesus Christ. And it goes on to establish an analogy between Mary and Christ, which helps us understand the significance of the Blessed Virgin's royal status. (coughs) Excuse me. At the end of this, I'll take Benadryl and go to bed before I go to work for tonight. <laughs> okay. Um, where are we? Help me. On um, 176 bottom. Okay. Christ is king not only because he is the son of God, but also because he's the redeemer. Mary the queen is not only because she's the mother of God, but also because associated as the new Eve with the new Adam, she cooperated in this work of redemption of the whole human race. She's the co-redemptrix. That's what they're saying, right? In Mark's gospel, we read that on the day of the ascension of the Lord Jesus, he was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. In biblical language, to sit at the right hand of God means sharing his sovereign power. Okay, so John Paul II is taking a whole general audience to explain to us why um, theologically Our Lady is our queen. Taken up into heaven, Mary is associated with the power of her son, right? and is dedicated to the extension of the kingdom, sharing in the diffusion of divine grace in the world. In looking at the analogy between Christ's ascension and Mary's assumption, we can conclude that Mary, in dependence on Christ, is the queen who possesses and exercises over the universe a sovereignty granted to her by her son. 
The title of queen does not, course, of course, replace that of mother. Her queenship remains a corollary of her particular maternal mission and simply expresses the power conferred on her to carry out that mission. And this is citing Pope Pius IX. Having a mother, having a motherly affection for us, and being concerned for our salvation, she extends her care to the whole human race. Appointed by the Lord as Queen of Heaven and Earth, raised above all the choirs of angels and the whole celestial hierarchy of saints, sitting at the right hand of her only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, she obtains with great certainty what she asks. <coughs> Excuse me. With her motherly prayers. she ob Look at that, though. This is so powerful. She obtains with certainty what she asks with her motherly prayers. So when you ask Our Lady to intercede for you, she obtains it with certainty. She obtains what she asks, and it cannot be denied her. Have confidence. Go to Our Lady as we consecrate ourselves to her, right, on March 25th. We're giving her permission to have complete reign in our lives. And she will grant with certainty whatever we ask in such a way that it's for the good of our souls. Therefore, Christians look with trust to Mary the Queen. And this not only does not diminish, but it actually exalts their filial abandonment to her, who is the mother of the new order of grace. Indeed, the concern Mary the Queen has for mankind can be fully effective precisely by virtue of her glorious state, which derives from the assumption. St. Germarius highlights this very well. He holds that this state guarantees Mary's intimate relationship with her son and enables her to intercede in our favor. Addressing Mary, he says that Christ wanted to have, so to speak, the closeness of your lips and your heart. Thus he assents to all the desires that you express to him. When you suffer for your children, with his divine power, he does all that you ask of him. Our Lady does not just intercede for us with her lips. She does this. She suffers for her children to receive the message to receive the provision, to receive the healing. She takes into her body physically suffering um, as an offertory in union with Christ to earn it. So imagine the queen of heaven not only granting a poor person dinner who's starving, but putting on the apron and making it and serving it and spoon feeding them, right? She earns this as the image of Our Lady the Queen. It's Our Lady, the one who's uh, the sorrowful one, right? Or the suffering one. Must be why my allergy started. Okay. All things work for the good of those who love Christ. Therefore, Christians look with trust to Mary the Queen. Oops, I said that. One can conclude that the assumption favors Mary's full communion, not only with Christ, but with each one of us. She is beside us because her glorious state enables her to follow us in our daily earthly journey. As we read again in St. Germar Germanus, you dwell spiritually with us and the greatness of your vigilance over us makes your communion of life with us stand out. Thus, far from creating distance between her and us, Mary's glorious state brings about a continuous and caring closeness. She knows everything that happens in our life and supports us with maternal love in life's trials. It is easy to just say that, but it's so true. She knows everything that takes place in our life. And she supports us. Like, if we comprehend that, it's just remarkable. Taken up into heavenly glory, Mary dedicates herself totally to the work of salvation 
in order to communicate to every living person the happiness granted to her. She is a queen who gives all that she possesses, participating above all in the life and the love of Christ. She gives everything she possesses to us. So here, we're giving everything we are and everything we possess to Our Lady. She is going to give everything that she possesses to us. Blessed Pope Pius XII wrote the following quotes explaining Our Lady's queenship in his encyclical Aceli Regina when he proclaimed the queenship of Our Lady. From the earliest ages of the Catholic Church, a Christian people, whether in time of triumph or more especially in time of crisis, has addressed prayers of petition and hymns of praise and veneration to the Queen of Heaven. Never has that hope wavered which they placed in the mother of the divine King. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, nor has that faith ever failed by which we are taught that Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, reigns with a mother's solicitude over the entire world, just as she is crowned in heavenly blessedness with the glory of a queen. In this matter, we do not wish to propose a new truth to be believed by Christians, since the title and arguments on which Mary's queenly dignity is based have already been clearly set forth. From early times, Christians have believed, and not without reason, that she of whom was born the Son of the Most High received privileges of grace above all other beings created by God. When Christians reflected upon the intimate connection that obtains between a mother and a son, they readily acknowledged the supreme royal dignity of the mother of God. But the Blessed Virgin Mary should be called queen not only because of her divine motherhood, but also because God willed her to have the exceptional role in the work of our eternal salvation. What more joyful and sweeter thought can we have than that Christ is our king, not only by natural right, but also by an acquired right that he won by redemption. God the Father sent Jesus to the world to be the king, but he also won his kingship on the cross, right? Where he was crowned and it said, this is, you know, the king of the Jews. So sorry, we're almost done. Now, in the accomplishing of this work of redemption, the Blessed Virgin Mary was most asso closely associated with Christ. So it's fitting to sing in the sacred liturgy near the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There stood sorrowful the Blessed Mary, Queen of Heaven and Queen of the World. St. Anselm said, Just as God, by making all through his power, is Father and Lord of all, so the Blessed Mary, by repairing all through her merits, is mother and queen of all. For God is the Lord of all things, because by his command he establishes each of them in its own nature. Mary is the queen of all things, because she restores each to its original dignity through the grace that she merited. All graces came to us through Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ came to us through Mary. And he continues to use her as a mediatrix of the graces he wants to give to us. We're just going to skip that. It's beautiful, though, just how the poor, especially and persecuted in the world, need to look to her as a queen, right? Here at the end are just five beautiful quotes from saints on Our Lady's queenship. St. Bonaventure says she has surpassed the riches of the virgins, the confessors, the martyrs, the apostles, the prophets, the patriarchs, and the angels. For she herself is the first fruit of the virgins, the mirror of confessors, the rose of martyrs, the ruler of apostles, the oracle of prophets, the daughter of patriarchs, the queen of angels. 
And St. Louis de Montfort says, Mary has the authority over the angels and the blessed in heaven. As a reward for her great humility, God gave her the power and the mission of assigning to the saints the thrones made vacant by the apostate angels who fell away through pride. Such is the will of the Almighty God, who exalts the humble, that the powers of heaven, earth, and hell, willingly or unwillingly, must obey the commands of the humble Virgin Mary. For God has made her queen of heaven and earth, leader of his armies, keeper of his treasure, dispenser of his graces, mediatrix on behalf of men, destroyer of his enemies, and faithful associate in his works and triumphs. The cure of ours, St. John Maria Vienni says, to serve the Queen of Heaven is already to reign there, and to live under her commands is more than to govern. If we can serve the Queen of Heaven and allow her to reign in our own homes, our own families, our own hearts, then we already live in heaven. Because nowhere that Our Lady comes can heaven not come. St. Maximilian Kolbe said, Prayer is powerful beyond limits when we turn to the Immaculata, who is the queen of even God's heart. Right? And St. Cardinal John Henry Newman says, No one has access to the Almighty as his mother has. None has merit such as hers. Her son will deny her nothing that she asks, and herein lies her power. While she defends the church, neither height nor depth, men nor evil spirits, great monarchs or crafts of man, nor popular violence can avail to harm us. For human life is short, but Mary reigns above, a queen forever. One last <clears throat> section. It's so good you guys are here because when I have to do things live and I'm sick, I just skip. But I can't because I don't want to annoy people that I'm like, Ugh. but this is good. So, um, you can close your eyes and listen. This is as if Our Lady is speaking to your heart. I am queen. I am queen of heaven and queen of earth, queen of bodies and queen of all hearts. I am queen of families, of relationships, of your work, your vocation, ministry, and life. I am queen of your possessions and queen of God's plans for your life. I am queen and I reign over all with my son because of my love. To the decree that a soul loves God and is cemented as one with him through the Holy Spirit of love is the degree that one reigns with God in his love. I have authority over heaven and earth because my heart is immaculate. Absolutely nothing comes between any part of my being and that of God, his love and his holy will for heaven and earth. Because of the authority that he entrusted to my fiat and my love, my prayer has efficacy before the throne of God, unlike any other human who has existed or who will exist. My heart glows as a furnace of love for God, and so any intentions that you entrust to me, even your very life that you entrust to me, is thrown into this furnace of love within me, which is the fire of the Holy Spirit and purified and transformed and glows before God as an ember in the chamber of my heart. For this reason, my prayers have an efficacy of love unlike any other human being. My prayers for you have the efficacy of my son's love for you, crucified and risen. Lord of mercy, Christ have mercy on us. Lord have mercy on us. Infant Jesus, hear us. Infant Jesus, graciously hear us. God the Father of heaven. God the Son, Redeemer of the world. God the Holy Spirit. Holy Infant Mary. Infant Daughter of the Father. Infant Mother of the Son. 
Pray for us. Infant spouse of the Holy Spirit. Pray for us. Infant fruit of the prayers of thy parents. Pray for us. Infant sanctuary of the Holy Trinity. Pray for us. Infant Mary, riches of thy father. Pray for us. Infant Mary, delight of thy mother. Pray for us. Infant Mary, honor of thy father. Pray for us. Infant Mary, honor of thy mother. Pray for us. Infant Mary, miracle of nature. Pray for us. Infant Mary, prodigy of grace. Pray for us. Immaculate in thy conception. Pray for us. Infant Mary, most holy in thy nativity. Pray for us. Infant Mary, most devout in thy presentation. Pray for us. Infant Mary, masterpiece of God's grace. Pray for us. Infant Mary, aura of the Son of Justice. Pray for us. Infant Mary, beginning of our joy. Pray for us. Infant Mary, end of our evil. Pray for us. Infant Mary, joy of the earth. Pray for us. Infant Mary, pattern of our charity. Pray for us. Infant Mary, model of our humility. Pray for us. Infant Mary most powerful. Pray for us. Infant Mary most mild. Pray for us. Infant Mary most pure. Pray for us. Infant Mary most obedient. Pray for us. Infant Mary most poor. Pray for us. Infant Mary most meek. Pray for us. Infant Mary most amiable. Pray for us. Infant Mary most admirable. Pray for us. Infant Mary incomparable. Pray for us. Infant Mary, health of the sick. Pray for us. Infant Mary, comfortess of the afflicted. Pray for us. Infant Mary, refuge of sinners. Pray for us. Infant Mary, hope of Christians. Pray for us. Infant Mary, lady of the angels. Pray for us. Infant Mary, daughter of the patriarchs. Pray for us. Infant Mary, desire of the prophets. Pray for us. Infant Mary, mistress of the apostles. Pray for us. Infant Mary, strength of martyrs. Pray for us. Infant Mary, glory of the priesthood. Pray for us. Infant Mary, joy of confessors. Pray for us. Infant Mary, purity of virgins. Pray for us. Infant Mary, queen of all saints. Pray for us. Infant Mary, our mother. Pray for us. Infant Mary, queen of our hearts. Pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Pray Spare for us, us, infant Jesus. Jesus. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Graciously hear us, infant Jesus. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us, infant Jesus. Infant Jesus, hear us. Infant Jesus, infant. Hear us, right. <laughs> o Almighty and merciful God, who through the cooperation of the Holy Spirit prepared the body and soul of the Immaculate Infant Mother, that she might be the worthy mother of thy Son and preserved her from all stain. Grant that we who venerate with all our hearts her most holy childhood may be freed through her merits and intercession from all uncleanness of mind and body and be able to imitate her perfect humility, obedience, and charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. And I suggest doing the consecration on Monday. They changed the Annunciation this year. If you want to do it on the Feast of the Annunciation, that's fine. But to me, the... March 25th is the Feast of the Annunciation. So I do that. I suggest you do it in front of the Blessed Sacrament. But I think I'm going to pray the prayer. I'm going to read it here because some of our people don't have the book or don't know it. And you can pray it along with me if you want or just like in your head here. But I want to include it at the end of this. It's long. Sorry. But um, then those who are following us who want to pray that prayer and maybe they're in a country that doesn't have the books or things like that, then it's it's prayed. But um, like I will redo it officially Monday and that's what I encourage you to do or on the actual feast that's transferred, okay? If you don't like this prayer, you can do any. You can do Louis de Montfort's, Maximilian Colby's, your own. And I encourage you like to hand write one hand write something out and give it to our lady you know but to the maria bambina holy infant blessed mother my dearest mama mary maria bambina i come to you today as a poor weak empty sick little sister and little sinner <laughs> that i am before you i stand as your weakest child and yet dependent upon you for all things i trust in the magnificence of your powerful plan of my love for your life i and then say your name mary elizabeth ann Klaska, consecrate myself to you again this day offering to your purest arms heart and love 
all who I am, all that I do, all who the Father desires me to become as a great saint of his eternal plan of love. I give you my little flower of perfection, who always said fiat to the Holy Spirit, my mind, body, heart, soul, spirit, emotions, and memory, my past, present, and future, family, relationships, home, property, possessions, and finances, my education, my work, ministry, the Fiat Foundation, the Children of the Cross, the Bethany House of Crucified Love and Prayer, my desires, fears, hopes, and dreams, and I ask you to weave them into the plan of perfect love that the Father keeps in his heart for me. I give you my littlest mother, my complete fiat, and I ask you to unite it with your own as well as with Jesus' fiat on the cross, in the resurrection, and all the days of his life. Make us one in our total trustful surrender to God's will in all things. Draw me into the womb of your immaculate and sorrowful heart, O mother. Be my house of gold. Be the star leading me to your son, Jesus Christ. Be the mystic rose whose perfume fills my entire being as I enter in to live within the center of your heart. O Holy Mother, be my tower of ivory, whose faithfulness holds me firmly united as one to God in all things, especially to Jesus crucified. Dearest Mother, my Lady of Chestahava, our little Mother of Guadalupe, Immaculate Mother of Sorrows, Prayerful Mother of Carmel, our Pilgrim Lady of Fatima, Lourdes, La Salette, Akita, Cabejo, Medjugorje, Our Lady the Never Fading Blossom, Our Mother Clothed with the Sun, My Hope of Perpetual Help, Good Remedy and Consolation, Our Lady Undoer of Knots, My Holy Queen of Peace. I ask for you to take my heart, and you can name other people's hearts, the hearts of all of our families, both physically and spiritual. And the hearts of all those who your divine son desires to help me with on the way of my vocation. And I ask you to place them within the divine light of the Holy Spirit's presence within your own heart and to give them to Jesus. Please ask him to take our hearts and to pray over each one of them individually in a special way remaking them, recreating and transforming them as he sees fit to be identical to the hearts he desired for us to hold within our beings from the beginning, full of the Father's fresh breath of life, love, humility, holiness, silence, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, patience, courage, temperance, prudence, fortitude, kindness, gentleness, strength, piety, purity, peace, hope, faith, confidence, and trust. Mary, our mother, I ask you to hold our hearts under the fountain of the love and mercy that flows in Jesus's blood and water, tears and sweat, fiat and look, forgiveness and understanding, hope and trust. From each and every wound on his holy body on the cross, and most especially from his heart, just as his gift as redemption to us was concrete and physical in and through his body. I pray that it also touches and changes our minds, emotions, memory, psychology, spirit, soul, and heart. May this redemption fall upon us through Jesus's breath from on the cross in the Eucharist and which you felt as he spoke to you resurrected. I ask that each of us is changed, healed, converted, enlightened, and filled with perfect purity, wisdom, peace, surrender, courage, holiness, humility, silence, and love. From this consecration to your infant, immaculate, and sorrowful heart, Jesus' sacred heart and blood, and to the Holy Spirit through your intercession. No prayer asked through your intercession, my mother, or through the power of Jesus' most holy wounds, and in his name will be ignored or denied by our good Father in heaven. So please beg Jesus for me, my mother, that he places his wounded hands upon each of us, 
especially our hearts, and to pray for us to the Father and to heal, fill, convert, and transform us completely to be little images of you and the intimate love you share with him. I ask him, my crucified husband and Lord, to say the powerful words he so often said on earth when he prayed for those who asked us help. Be done, be healed, be delivered, be changed, be filled, be protected, be blessed. I want it according to my Father's will. I ask to be one heart with him as a Siamese identical twin, united as husband and wife in human and divine perfect love. I especially ask for the seemingly impossible graces that burn in my heart and are placed there before the Holy Spirit. Mary, my little infant mother, I thank you for the example of humility, meekness, and loneliness that you have given to us in your holy infancy. I thank you for your beautiful maternal and big sisterly love. I reconsecrate my life and vocation to your most perfect heart and to Jesus' most precious wounded heart on the cross. I ask him to fill my fiat as he filled yours with his Father's holy will and his Spirit's powerful presence and to make all in my life, my vocation, my family's lives, my spiritual children's lives be fulfilled perfectly according to his will. I give you everything, Jesus, through Mary, and I praise and thank you for your perfect, never-ending, faithful love. Please set the fire of your love and life in my vocation again, now and always. Help me to trust in you. Help me receive all of your love. Jesus, have mercy on us. Jesus, I trust in you. O infant, sorrowful, and immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us. Holy Mother Maria Bambina, Queen of heaven and earth, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.